How do you start a legal cannabis business and how much will it cost you? I'm Khalilo Reynolds and it's time for another episode of Money Moves JA, brought to you in partnership with Exim Bank's business advisory service, giving you the tools to grow your business. My guest today is the Director of Licensing and Applications at the Cannabis Licensing Authority, Oshane Williams. Hi, Oshane. Welcome to Money Moves JA. Thank you. So, you're the man who has a whole bunch of information. I get asked this question. People want to know how do you start a legal cannabis farm? What are the steps that you need to take? It depends on the license type you're applying for. So, we have five license types. We have cultivator, and that goes from tier one to tier three. A tier one is less than one acre. A tier two is one acre to five acres, and a tier three is more than five acres. Then you have your processing license that is also in two categories, category one and two. Category one meaning less than 200 square feet, category two more than 200 square feet. Then you have retail herb house. Then you have retail herb house without facilities for consumption. So in one instance, you can actually consume cannabis on the property and in the other you have to purchase and take it away. Mm. And then you have retail therapeutic license where they would apply cannabis on your, on your person, like aromatherapy mm -hmm. sort of thing. And then you have your R&D license. It can be research for experimental purposes or research for analytical services. And then you have your transportation license that would allow you to transport ganja from <coughs> one license type to another. So firstly, it depends on which part of the business you are interested in. Mm -hmm. But I understand that most persons are usually interested in the cultivation aspect or the retailing aspect. Mm -hmm. Now, with regards to cultivation, what but you if you need, to, if you're in cultivation, don't, would you need a transport license as well? No, not necessarily. So what we have now are some interim protocols that would allow you to transport ganja from one license type to another. But you could apply for a transport license, which would give you that. That's the, the, the legal, authorized, <coughs> regulatory way to transport from one place to another. But we have some interim procedures in place for now. So if you want to be a cultivator, what do you do? So if you want to be a cultivator, the first thing, primary thing is land. Mm -hmm. Land is, an, is essential. So you need to have your land ready. That is one. Two, you would need the requisite. Do you need to own the land or it can be leased? Or? No, it, can be, it can be leased. Okay. So you can be the titled owner in one instance. The land can also be unregistered as long as there is a, you can identify an owner and that owner gives you consent to use it. So we have a consent form that the titled owner would sign up and give, essentially giving you permission to use the land and then you would engage in a lease agreement if necessary to detail that type of transaction. Second thing, you'd have to build out your infrastructure, which is essentially fencing, building, surveillance and access control. Mm -hmm. So let me use a tier one for an example. So security. Security, basically, because again, we're dealing with a dangerous drug, quote unquote, that is how it is scheduled. So for example, a tier one license, which is less than one acre, you would need to have one that perimeter fencing and the type of fencing is defined, chain link fencing, woven mesh, square mesh, whatever the case may be, up to six feet, seven inches tall. Then you would need to show defined areas within those boundaries for the purpose of cultivating. So you need to show the area where you intend to grow, the area where you intend to store, the area where you intend to dry the ganja, the area where you intend to dispose of it. And then within those areas, you would need surveillance to show, obviously, persons moving within those spaces. And then finally, you would need access control, which could be something as simple as an access card reader. It could be a biometric scanner, or it could be something like a book where someone signs in and signs out of each of these designated areas. So essentially, that is what, that is, those are the most important things. It's mm -hmm. more, more about the infrastructure than anything else. Okay, and the fees, what are the fees? Well, for tier one, the fee is 2,000 US per acre. Now, it's 2,000 US for the tier one. And when you go to tier two, to tier two I believe it's 2,500 per acre up to five acres. And then for tier three, it is 3,000 US for every acre over five acres. Mm -hmm. A bit pricey. Um, by itself, it may appear that way, but um, our internal team did 
a study, a research of, um, across the globe, actually, say looking at Oceania, Africa, North America, and other in places in Europe. And surprisingly, our rates are actually the cheapest globally. So despite, I'm saying to you right now, 2,000 US, et cetera, et cetera. But when you look at comparatively, we are very, 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 very cheap. Actually, the cheapest. OK. And do you have certain regulations, like things that people can't breach? Yes, certainly. So I mean, again, you're dealing with a dangerous drug. So obviously, there would be things in place to ensure that it is dealt with in a particular way and it is being dealt with for medicinal purposes. So our regulations would indicate that you don't, you cannot, for example, the fencing, you can't have breaches in the fencing. It has to be at the requisite height. Your surveillance must always be operational. It must always be recording 24 hours a day. You must have surveillance up to 90 days of storage so that we can go in and do our reconciliations, our review, our inspections, stuff like that. You would also need to ensure that your access control is being properly used. Because we need to know that if O'Shane Williams went into this room, there mm -hmm. is some record to indicate that he right. did in fact go there. Are so. there limitations on what you can, like how much cannabis you can grow on the farm, for example? Actually, no. So what happens currently is that our licensees would indicate to us how much they intend to grow on their plot of land. So it is up to the imagination or the innovation of the applicant to determine how much they want to grow on that plot of land. Mm -hmm. I remember couple a few years ago there was talk about tagging the plants do you have to tag each individual plant how does that work yes so currently each plant on the cultivation site has to be tagged uniquely tagged with a unique number and that is to ensure that the us the authority knows how many and can distinguish one plant from another it is also an international requirement so when you look at who we report to the international narcotics control board otherwise called the INCB they are the ones who dictate um, certain things, and, and we have to abide by those, um, those rules and those guidelines internationally because we have reporting requirements. Right. So yes, each ganja plant has to be tagged. So that's another cost. Do you know how much that costs to, to, for the tags? Reasonably so. It could cost maybe a cent US per tag, mm -hmm. or probably less. If you get the printer with the ink, you, you buy the rolling paper and you get the numbers. When you look at the economies of the scale, when you start to print the end block, it's, it's not very much. Where do you put it? On one of the leaves? Or where, where exactly do you put the tag? So the tag goes around the stalk of the uh, plant once it gets to a certain height. Mm -hmm. And it is not affixed so tight as to cause it to damage it or anything like that. But it is just affixed so that whenever our enforcement team goes in, they can distinguish one number and okay. one plant from another. So you have license fees, you have security costs, you have right. tagging. Do you have a, a ballpark of how much it might cost to start up a, let's say, a one-acre plot? That's the smallest size, right? It's just the smallest yeah. size. So to start up a one-acre legal cannabis farm, how much mm -hmm. would that cost? Well, that's a tricky question, and I'll tell you why I say that. How much it costs sometimes is, of the, is based on the imagination of the applicant. For example, if I say to you, you need a phone to do this job, there are some persons who might go out and buy an iPhone 30 Pro Max. Mm -hmm. Some other persons may buy a, a Samsung A20. So our regulations are results driven. So we say to our applicants, we want a surveillance of this area. Now, it is up to you if you want to engage guardsmen and have guardsmen install the surveillance or you go to Price Mart and get the surveillance system for 25000 and install it itself. Mm -hmm. So the cost can vary depending on how the person plans to implement those things. So it may not be, it may not be much or it can be a lot depending on the person's own standards. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't necessarily offer you a cost because again, it, it is subjective to what That must be a minimum does. class though. Um, what I could say, if you're looking at the license fee of 2000 that would translate to maybe 300000 if you do the, the conversion. Jamaican. If you're looking at the processing fee, which is, let's just say 300 if you're an individual, that's about 45000 so at 345 If you're looking at fencing, that's probably a few hundred thousand for the fencing. And you could reasonably get a 20 by 20 structure built for um, probably another few hundred thousand. So I would say a ballpark figure. Plus the cost of the plants. 
Well, the, the cost of the plants, well, the cost of the plants can come from own source. Right. So because our legislation allows us to have five at home plants, mm -hmm. those are the plants that you can use to start your cultivation. So the cost of the plants will essentially be free for you if you have them at home. So anywhere about 1.5 million could, could potentially get you going. Okay. What are the fines if you breach these regulations? Well, currently we do not. Our legislation doesn't give us any fines if you breach a regulation. But what it does, though, however, is that you could be either be suspended or have your license revoked if you breach a regulation. But, but we don't get to that point overnight. It's not something that we escalate immediately. So there are incremental steps up to that point. So if someone would have to be breaching and breaching and breaching, and it depends on the severity of the breach and stuff like that. But we try to work with the licensees of a very robust compliance and monitoring section. So we don't usually get to that point. So how many licenses have been granted to date? Um, 102. 102. Most of them are in the cultivation category? The majority are cultivators. Not That's surprising. <laughs> not at all. So how do people get in touch with you if they're thinking about going into this business? Well, they can call our office. They can go on our website. They can go on our Instagram page. They can go on our Twitter page. Any type of social media account that we have, or they can call the office line, that's fine. They can get in touch with us. All right, thank you so much, Ashin. Thank you. Great information. That's it for this episode of Money Moves JA, brought to you in partnership with Exim Bank's Business Advisory Service, giving you the tools to grow your business. Visit their website at eximbankja.com and follow them on social media, including YouTube and Instagram. You can check out my website, kalilareynolds.com, for a summary of this episode. I'm Kalila Reynolds. Until next time. Hey.